at Mickey Grove. Uh, June 11th is Skeptic Hal up in Oakland. So it's a uh, wonderful thing, lots of speakers. I hope you guys can join if you've never been there before. Uh, then on July 19th is our next colloquium, who our professor, Professor Noel, who is a neuroscientist at, uh, and professor at UC Merced, is giving our next talk, so I hope you can join us. Uh, if you wanna help us out in any ways, there's uh, some things you can do besides just joining up and coming to the events. You can host an event yourself. If you're interested in something, you don't see it on the meetup and you wanna do it, let us know and, and we'll, uh, if it's a good idea, we'll, we'll put it on. Uh, if you feel like donating tonight, as well as purchasing the book, of course, <laughs> there's a basket there. Uh, your donations definitely go a long way to help us uh, do more things like this. And, you know, volunteers are always welcome. So if you just have an extra day and wanna help out any way you can, just let us know. Let us know after the colloquium, go to our Facebook, go to our meetup. Someone's always available to uh, talk to you. So, <laughs> those are the announcements. Now time for the introduction. Who is David Fitzgerald? <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Short ones. <laughs> well, if you don't know, he is a longtime atheist activist. He also was the founder of the Atheist Film Festival in San Francisco, which I was privy to go to once. It was very, very good. And he is also on the board for the San Francisco Center for Inquiry. And of course, he's also an author. He has written uh, three books. Uh, one is called Nailed, 10 Christian Myths That Show Jesus Never Existed at All. Second one is Be Mormons. And the third one, the one that he's going to talk about tonight, is Jesus Mything in Action. <laughs> three volumes on sale tonight. Uh, and it's actually kind of nice because Usually, uh, you, we see a lot of debates among us fellow free thinkers and, and people of religion, but lately we've been doing a lot of uh, back and forth between Jesus. In fact, last year, uh, Bart Ehrman did a big debate with Robert Price on if Jesus really existed, so it's kind of neat, neat to see the other side of another free thinker who actually is saying that he mm, doesn't exist. And of course, David Fitzgerald, he's the only one of our speakers that have been here before that we actually had to do a parental advisory warning <laughs> <laughs> to let no children come to his talk, sexy violence, violent sex, uh, and the, what's it called in the- The dumbass morality of the Bible. The dumbass morality of the Bible. I said that word, yes I did. <laughs> so please give a warm welcome to David Fitzgerald. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the great turnout tonight. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it because we're starting a little late. So first, a quick question. How many of you on the scale of, yes, of course there was a Jesus, to no, there wasn't a Jesus, or somewhere in between? If we start over here with the, just by show of hands, how many are certain there was Jesus? Not quite so certain. I don't know if there was a Jesus. Yeah, there was probably a Jesus. Or no way in hell there was a Jesus. Okay, we've got a really good mix, so I'm very happy about that. Um, well, you're in luck, because Jesus Mything in Action could be subtitled The Myth is a Survival Handbook and Kung Fu Manual, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Jesus Myth Theory. So first of all, here's the real question. Why would anybody say that Jesus never existed? Well, certainly this guy wouldn't have done that 15 plus years ago. Um, in fact, it wasn't until I read this book. How many of you guys have ever seen this book, Ken's Guide to the Bible? Awesome, but very underrated. No one's heard of it anymore. But it was the one book that first got me wondering about, you know, I, of course, there was a Jesus, it had to be a Jesus, you know. Um, but it first got me wondering, what was the real Jesus about, not just the Jesus we see in the Gospels? So what did he really say and do? and how much of the Gospels was just legendary add-ons. Well, long story short, after about two years of looking into that, and then five years of talking about me looking into that, in 2010 I came up with a book called Nailed, uh, Ten Christian Myths That Show Jesus Never Existed at All. Are we a little too loud? It feels awful loud. I think you're fine, but no, okay. fine. Yeah. All right. Feels a little echoey. Testing one, two, three. Oh, now that seems too soft. 
<laughs> Is that good? Yeah. All right. What do you for? And in that book, I covered like the top ten ways that I just felt that the official story of, of Jesus and Christianity's origins just did not pass the reality test. Um, including the idea that Jesus is a myth is ridiculous. That was the first one. I also talked about the historical corroboration of the Gospels, or the lack thereof, for all the spectacular events that we see in the Gospels that never quite made a historical footprint. Um, I talk about Flavus Josephus, um, who is the only Jewish historian in ancient times, he's a historian full stop, who appears to be mentioning Jesus outright rather than just Christianity. Um, and talk about why his passage, the so-called Testimonium Flavinium, is actually probably written by this guy, Eusebius of Caesarea, about 300 years after the fact. And finally, I talk about how histor history, archaeology, and textual criticism all confirm the Gospels is a huge, huge lie. And the Gospels themselves, of course, um, contradict each other, they contradict Paul, and they contradict the rest of the New Testament. But what about the written evidence? Well, we have many manuscripts. We don't have anything from the first century. From the second century, we don't have manuscripts per se. We have pieces of manuscripts, fragments of manuscripts, like the one you're seeing here. And it's not until way towards the end of the second century um, that we can even point to complete books of the New Testament. When I first wrote Nailed, um, this passage here, uh, this one right here at the bottom, P52, that was considered to be the oldest uh, fragment of a New Testament book from the Gospel of Mark. It was dated from a range between 125 to 175, and of course, anytime you hear a Christian mention it, they'll say, oh, it dates to 125 or earlier. It's like, no, 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 no. That's the far end of the earliest it could possibly be. That's what I was saying in 2010. Since then, it turns out that the actual papyrus, uh, Paprologists who um, study the texts, they never made a claim that it was even in late 2nd century. They think it's either very late 2nd century or maybe early 3rd century. So it, it's, uh, it's just another case of Christian claims getting exaggerated, which we have. Another uh, Christian myth, Christianity began with Jesus and his apostles, was new and unique, and spread like wildfire across the ancient world. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, it took about 300 years for Christianity to even reach the level of even the weird Roman cults, the little minor cult things. And finally, I asked in the book, in the, the penultimate chapter, can Jesus be saved? And I talked about all the ways that things would have to be different in, the, in Christianity, in the New Testament, in just the way early Christian history played out for, their, for me to even think there might have been a guy named Jesus and all the ways that would be different. Well, it boiled down to me for this one central paradox, that if Jesus had been an actual figure, here's the problem. He either taught these amazing things, if not did amazing miracles and such, and no one outside his cult noticed for over 100 years, or he didn't, and yet soon after his death, we have all these feuding little house cults that can't agree about the first thing about his life, springing up not just in the Galilee, not just in Judea, but all across the Roman Empire. And that fact alone was, for me, a big huge red flag that there simply couldn't have been a historical Jesus. Well, there was a great reaction to the book, I must say. Uh, I knew the Christians weren't going to love it. I, that, that's not special. I didn't think that was going to be a problem. But what did surprise me is how much um, of a blowback I got from our fellow atheists. And not just in the, oh, you know, I disagree with you, you're wrong. That's not special. You know, of course you're going to get that. But it was the level of vociferousness from our fellow atheists um, that really took me by surprise. Oddly enough, when I wrote my next book after that, The Mormons, the atheists and the Christians both loved me again. So go figure. <laughs> so, but this did give me pause because uh, I was wondering why I was getting such you know, level of, of, of anger from our fellow non-believers. And finally it dawned on me. And what was happening is, they were setting off the same red flags that they get from Holocaust deniers, or global warming deniers, or saying that the people said the moon landing was fake. You know, all these different sorts of pseudoscience bullshit that we've learned to hate, they have lumped in Jesus Smith theory with that. And again, long story short, that is why I wound up making this book, Jesus Smithing in Action. Um, 
which as you see is not just one book, it's three books. Um, and the reason <laughs> is for that, it was never intended to be three books, but when everything was said and done, I was talking to my audiobook engineer, Dave Smalley from Dogwood Bay, and um, we were talking about doing the audiobook. And I said, yeah, it's about a quarter of a million words, and it's, it's kind of a big book, it's, about, it's almost 500 pages. And he says, wait, wait, how many, how many words count is that again? And I said, it's just over a quarter of a million. He says, okay, are those eight and a half by 11 pages or those six by nine book size pages? And I went, oh no. So it turned out that Jesus Mythic in Action was much closer to 900 pages, which is why we broke it up into three very reader friendly uh, volumes instead of one big, you know, phone book size volume. And one of the first questions I address in the new book is why don't historians question Jesus historicity? That's probably the first objection I get out of the gate from either Christians or from, uh, from atheists. And the first thing is, well, actually, it's not quite true that no historians uh, doubt Jesus' historicity. In fact, a growing number are willing to uh, go on record to say so. So, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a bit. Robert Price says, the mythicist case has been rebutted? Really? When did that happen? The arguments of the mythicist camp have never been refuted. They've only been steadfastly ignored. Or to put it in one word, like he uses, they've been harumphed. <laughs> so the question is, why don't more historians question Jesus' historicity? Well, consider this. If you take all historians <coughs> as a field, if you get, uh, pose a, a biblical question to them, they're going to pitch, rightly so, to the biblical historians. Well, who are the biblical historians? If you look at them, you find that overwhelmingly, and ever since there has been such a thing as uh, biblical studies, they've been theologians, they've been clergy, they've been pastors, Catholic, evangelical. Not all biblical historians are even historians. They've got their degrees in music, or Christian education, or doctors of divinity. Can we quantify that? We certainly can. So, it's fairly <coughs> problematic to do a survey on every single biblical historian in the United States and ask them what their position is. But it occurred to us that it was t totally possible to do a survey, in fact, not just a survey, but a complete census on every single American learning institution that offers some sort of New Testament, biblical, Jesus studies, and or degrees in it. So we did, and this is what we found. Of the 4,726 degree-granting institutions of higher education in the United States, 1,417 of them offer some form of Jesus studies, biblical studies, New Testament studies. Of that batch, um, just over 800 of them are religiously um, affiliated, just under 600 of them non-affiliated. So there's a pretty even 57-43% uh, split on being religiously affiliated. Looking at those, we asked, how many of these religious schools, which are the majority of biblical uh, institutions already, um, require a statement of faith or some kind of creedal statement that says, you will tow this theological line and you will always tow it or else you will work here anymore. And I was surprised that, well, first, a third of them full out require that. And I was actually surprised when those results came back because I expected it to be a lot higher. And sure enough, it turned out that when we looked a little deeper into that, um, 33% is only the number of people who were publicly willing to admit that they required that. What we, when we looked a little further, we found them on their websites, we got people to see it to um, admit that actually it was closer to 67% that we found that they require this um, statement of faith, a theological uh, line that they can't cross. And it may be well as, as high as all of them. So the question isn't, shouldn't be how many historians reject mythicism, but how many historians are contractually obligated to publicly reject mythicism? And why aren't more of them, uh, ah, dang, I just passed right past, here we go. Uh, my, why aren't more of them mythicists? Well, as Upton Sinclair said, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Could not have said it better, let alone his salvation. But honestly, is it realistic to think that an entire profession could be wrong about the central focus of their field of study? Well, ask your pastor. <laughs> Most biblical scholars are just as wrong about their being a Jesus as they are about their being a God, and for the exact same reason. But what about secular biblical scholars? Before I, 
answer that, let me just point out one thing. All the fields and subfields of biblical studies have a unique situation that I touch in the book. I call it the Belfast analogy. It's an uncomfortable place to be an atheist in biblical studies. Uh, in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, you had a minority, the Ulster Protestants up in the north, outnumbered by Irish Catholics. But within the north itself, the Catholics were the minority of the minority. And the, the, in turn, Protestants made life miserable for the Catholic minority within their own borders. Um, in the same way, Christianity has always complained that it's outnumbered by the secular world and surrounded by evil and sin and, and pagan types like ourselves. And this also applies to academia, where secular academia also surrounds biblical studies. But within that little walled city of biblical studies, still today it probably remains the only field in science, if not history, where Christianity still dominates and still makes life hard for those who don't share their doctrine. Am I saying this is a conspiracy theory? Of course not. Am I saying that Christian biases and presumptions pervade the entire field? Of course I am. And how could it be otherwise? And I'm by no means the only one who says so. Jesus studies is in crisis because Christianity is in crisis. They're both under tremendous pressure to show that everything is well and under control, even while their foundations are crumbling. Biblical studies is also dying out in secular academia, which first of all means there's fewer and fewer jobs for current and future biblical historians. And to make it worse, it also means that increasingly the only institutions offering positions in biblical studies are the religious institutions, which makes it all that much more difficult to espouse blasphemous theories. How many Bart Ehrman fans do we have in the audience? Yeah, well, me too, because I love the Bart man. Um, he is probably the most famous in the current uh, hip historicist mythicist debate, the most staunch historicist out there. And yet, for years, I've been saying that for such a staunch historicist, he's one of the best mythicist writers out there, because almost <laughs> every single book he's written has made our case all the easier. Um, except for this one, the book, Did Jesus Exist? And now, Mythos is like me, we didn't hate this book because we expected him to agree with it at all. But we hated it because we thought it was going to be the best defense of Jesus' historicity. And clear out the Deadwood, clear out the, of the bogus myth theories, because there's one thing about Jesus' myth theory, there is a lot of bullshit Jesus' myth theory out there. Probably as many bullshit Jesus' myth theory as there is bullshit Jesus' historicist theory. But all this book really did was showcase glaring errors and faulty presumptions of his own historicist position. Uh, most disturbing at all, it exposed the attitude of intimidation towards any scholar who shows too much inclination towards the mythicist position. And it's interesting in his later books, and he has another book still after this, it's, you see the same trend happening. You see him backing away from some of the claims he made in Did Jesus Exist, where he's realizing that things he was relying on as established fact, he's beginning to see as he looks into it more that it's not as established as he thought it was. And now he's going back and retreating so much so that I can't wait to see what he's going to be writing in five or ten years. Um, Philip Davies, the uh, emeritus professor at the University of Sheffield, had this to say about did Jesus exist. Um, the existence of Jesus issue has always been lurking within New Testament scholarship, and surely the rather fragile historical evidence for Jesus and others should be tested to see what weight it can bear, or even work out what kind of historical research might be appropriate. Such a normal exercise should hardly generate controversy in most fields of ancient history, but of course, New Testament studies is not a normal case. I don't think, however, in another 20 years there'll be a consensus that Jesus did not exist, or possibly didn't exist, but a recognition that his existence is not entirely certain would nudge Jesus' scholarship towards academic respectability in the first place. In the first place, what does it mean to affirm that Jesus existed anyway when we have so many different ones on display by the ancient sources and modern New Testament scholars? And I could not agree with that more. Uh, my friend Richard Carrier has, has said, I personally know quite a few professors who feel this way. They don't touch a subject with a tip of bowl precisely because they fear the kind of thing Ehrman is doing and threatening. They don't want to lose their jobs or career prospects and opportunities. They don't want to be ridiculed or marginalized. And I can speak on my behalf. I have friends on Facebook in academia, and they give me thumbs up about my new book, but they will not give a blurb for that very reason. Um, Rudolf Augustine, the founder and publisher of the Spiegel magazine in Germany, 
uh, said, I think this was during the 50s or 60s, this goes quite a ways back, that theologians and biblical scholars, quite prominent ones, had told me privately the party line of there being no doubt that Jesus was a real historical figure, as real as Julius Caesar or Otto von Bismarck, did not convince them that they had doubts, private doubts. But they kept their doubts private, and so the party line thrived, and dissenters continued to be relegated to outsider status and routinely mocked by the mainstream. And so this isn't, or at least it shouldn't be, a fight between historicists and mythicists. It's come down to be a fight between those historians who take Jesus' myth theory seriously, whether they agree with it or not, and those who dismiss it out of hand. Because historicists aren't the enemy. Christians aren't the enemy. Bullshit is the enemy. Who do men say that I am? Well, what are the Jesuses that we get from secular biblical scholars? We have a whole range from cynic philosopher to liberal Pharisee, all the way through here, violent zealot revolutionary, failed apocalyptic prophet, savior of the world, and these are just the ones that are most plausible. There's also Egyptian pharaoh, Roman agent, uh, high priest of a mushroom cult. Um, there's any number of crazy ass Jesus theories. Uh, and how realistic are any of them? Well, as far as they go, all of them on the top part of the chart here have their strengths. None of them are particularly far-fetched. They all tend to focus on particular constellations of biblical elements, interpret them in certain ways, and they reject other data as inauthentic. They all appeal to solid historical analogies for their take, but they do suffer from two fatal flaws. As Bart Ehrmans points out, most, if not all, don't make sense of Jesus' death, although neither do the Gospels. And ironically enough, Bart's favorite uh, candidate for the real historical Jesus' has failed apocalyptic prophet also doesn't make sense of Jesus' death, because it wasn't illegal to be a failed apocalyptic prophet. It wasn't even blasphemy to declare yourself the Messiah. As Robert Price points out, this very multiplicity of con convincing possibilities is precisely the problem. The various reconstructions of Jesus cancel each other out. Jesus simply wears too many hats in the Gospels. Exorcist, healer, king, prophet, sage, rabbi, demigod, and so on. He's a composite figure. The historical Jesus, if there was one, might well have been a Messianic king, or a progressive Pharisee, or a Galilean shaman, or a magus, or a Hellenistic sage, but he cannot very well have been all of them at the same time. So a quick point to ponder. Could Jesus have been a stealth Messiah? Because I'd often have people come to me and say, well, I'm sure there was like a couple guys named Jesus, and um, that no one, no one would take any notice of these guys. But in fact, we have several lesser messiahs, and these aren't even all the ones I mentioned in the book. There's a, a half dozen or so, or more that I get into, where all these guys did things that aren't really anywhere near as interesting what Jesus does in the Bible, and yet they all did something that Jesus couldn't do, and that was make a dent in the historical record at the time. And then there's the other Christ that we hear about in the Gospels and repeated in Paul's letter, where we're warned of other Christs and other Jesuses and other Gospels being preached. So will the real Jesus please stand up? Well, here's what I get into in the books. Um, chapter 1 of Dinosaurs and Deniers gets on that old the chestnut that this is creationism for atheists. And I cannot tell you, as, as the founder of Evolution Palooza, how much it drives me up the wall to have Jesus' myth theory compared to creationism, as my Christian friends know that very well. But nothing in Jesus' studies has the same level of supporting evidence as anything in evolutionary biology. In fact, this whole mythicism is creationism analogy is 100% backwards, and this is why. Creationists accuse big science of suppressing creationism, but there is no big science oppressing creationism. And there is big theology putting pressure on biblical scholars to toe their various theological lines. In chapter two, I talk about bias, <coughs> talking about um, uh, how biblical scholars get in trouble, even believing devout biblical Christian scholars get in trouble for things that are far less blasphemous than anything that we're talking about tonight. Uh, Mike Lacona, um, Tom Thompson. Tom Thompson, his career was almost destroyed out of the gate 30 years ago when he first uh, argued that the, the, the patriarchs and Moses, Abraham, these <coughs> characters were all mythical. And now that is the consensus opinion across the board. 30 years ago, completely blasphemous.
historical Jesus employing memory theory and what, uh, what uh, repercussions memory theory had on the historical Jesus argument. And nothing blasphemous that we know, nothing particularly new or scandalous, and yet he lost his job over it because it disturbed donors to the university. Number two, evolution didn't just come down from uh, Mount Sinai and cables from heaven. The more we studied the Earth, the more the cracks in creationism showed before Darwin ever showed up on the uh, scene. And just like creationism, the longer we study the Bible, the more the cracks in the historical Jesus study show. Religious and academic authorities did suppress, uh, try to suppress evolutionary theory, and yet they couldn't. And that's so ironic to me, it was when anyone says, oh, well, science has got this cabal out and they're putting the squelch on, on creationism. It's like, well, where were they 150 years ago when you guys ran the whole show? How did evolution get on board? I don't know if you can read the, the cartoon on the right there. It's the uh, it's um, William uh, King Bryant saying, uh, they shall not pass. It's the integrity of the word of God. This uh, crowd here is enemies of the Bible, that's us. And this crowd behind us, we are with you, Mr. Bryant, with many hundred thousand strong. Just as the majority of biblical scholars have tried to steadfastly ignore the questions and issues raised by mythicists, but the questions and issues aren't going away. Besides, biblical studies already had abundant examples of paradigm shifts. All, examples, all advancements in science begin as challenges to commonly held theory, but all advances in biblical studies begin as blasphemy. And yesterday's blasphemy is tomorrow's consensus. On every one of these bullet points here, uh, there was a time when no one would uh, argue what the consensus agrees on now. And yet, and yet, the initial response to all these other questions was exactly the same as a response to mid-theory now. That's ridiculous. All serious scholars disagree with you, and the evidence is overwhelming. But what we're finding out more and more is that all the beloved characters in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament but in the New Testament as well, are all mythical. Number three, creationists ignore mountains of evidence and dismiss entire fields of science. Whereas serious mythicists engage in the evidence and the scholarship and arguably make better sense of the data solving problems that the historicist paradigm hasn't been able to make sense of. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but most of what uh, mythicists argue is not bucking the consensus. It is the consensus. It's our conclusion, our taking it just a little bit further. But we're using the same arguments. Bucking the consensus, yes. Um, the problem with that is that what consensus, for starters? Because um, there is no consensus. If you get 50 biblical scholars in the room and ask them who Jesus was, you will get 50 different Jesuses. Um, Besides, most of what we argue isn't controversial. It's been majority opinion for decades and some for centuries. It's only our conclusions that are considered radical. And that's coming increasingly clear as well. And as even biblical scholars, even Christian biblical scholars have been complaining, um, the failure of scholarly methodology and criteria has been a no, no open secret for not just decades, but over 100 years. Every, as far back as Albert Schweitzer in 1904, he was already declaring that everything we, we think we know about Jesus has to be reshuffled. And in, since that time, we've had what they call three historical quests for Jesus, and every single one of them has ended in failure. And they said, oh, wait, no, no, that doesn't work. This doesn't work. We, we have to throw everything out and go back to square one. And we're just getting over the third one of those. There is, however, one significant difference between evolutionary theory and mythicist theory. Now, as scary as evolution is for your average fundamentalists, believers can twist their theology to make room for evolution. And increasingly, we see them doing just that, theistic evolution. The final step of that process, I predict, you heard it here first, is that they're going to be starting to take credit for evolution, saying that the Bible teaches it, it proves Christianity is true, we've always believed it, the usual co-opt song and dance they've done with every other thing they've co-opted from pop culture and science. But here's the thing. They can't co-op Jesus myth theory. If Jesus myth theory is true, and I just happen to think it is, then this is kryptonite for Christianity. There's just no two ways about it. Which is probably why I don't think it's a good idea to use that as your opening statement in, in questions with uh, 
Christians, your Christian friends. It's just a, it's, it will stop the, the discussion right there. But here, why do I think Jesus' myth theory is true? In chapter 6, I talk about what I call the source of our problems and the problems of our source. Because if you're going to say, tell me anything about who Jesus was or who he did, it has to boil down to, well, where are you reading this? What is your source for that? Oh, like I'm just saying right now. So what do our sources say? And how reliable are those sources? Well, there's a lot to unpack in the full answer to that, but here's the quick and dirty version. And note, for all this that I'm about to tell you, we aren't relying on arguments from silence. It's not just questioning the unreliability of our sources. It's not sheer speculation. We already have enough evidence to know that the official story of Christianity is very wrong. Whether there's a Jesus or not, the question is, just how very wrong is it? In a nutshell, ultimately, all our biographical information for Jesus comes from just four books, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Though it should be noted, there are a few discrepancies between these four books. And of course, I'm talking about Jesus' baptism, and his childhood, and his apostles, and his ministry. But apart from that, oh, and uh, his miracles, and his teachings, and, his, and just about and where, and when, and how, he did everything in the gospel from before his birth to after his death, and everywhere in between. And these are just the four that made the cut. These are just the four official ones. We've got loads of gospels that didn't even make the cut. And I talk about the gospels, we should know that they weren't written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they don't agree on who their Jesus was or what he did. Our Gospels are all anonymous. They don't claim to be eyewitnesses, let alone by the names attributed to them. They don't read like eyewitness accounts. They don't just have nitpicky, minor, little contradictions. They have basic, even crucial contradictions. And they contain anachronisms and error that shows that they were written long after the time they describe and probably far away from the setting they describe. They've neither been corroborated, nor uh, they are they authentic history, and all have been edited repeatedly. And lastly, every single one of them is derived from the very first gospel, the Gospel of Mark. The gospel that just happens to be the most fallible, inhuman, not inhuman, no-frills Jesus that we have. And the story evolves from there. But most importantly, Mark's gospel appears to be 100% allegory. For instance, just talking about Jesus' trial, for example. Can anybody tell me who this guy is here? Anyone want to hazard a guess? The thief? Good guess. It's not the thief. Barabbas? It is Barabbas. Good one, Troy. Yeah, you can see Jesus being let off stage left to be executed there. And this notorious murderer and Roman uh, rebel, Barabbas, um, is being freed to be released unharmed into the wilderness. Now, Barabbas, for you who are up on your Aramaic, means son of the father. And in fact, in some Syriac manuscripts, his name is Jesus Barabbas. So we have two Jesuses, two sons of the father. One, even though he's perfect and, and flawless, he is gonna be taken out and be made into a sacrifice for, for all of us. The one who's guilty of sin, of sedition, of murder, he's gonna be released into the wilderness unharmed. And it didn't take long for some Jewish uh, historians to realize, oh, you know what that is? That whole thing is an allegory for the Yom Kippur ritual, where we take one goat who becomes a sacrifice for Israel, and the other one is released as a scapegoat into the wilderness unharmed. And every point of, the, of the, that Barabbas story make, makes perfect sense of that allegory. As history, it makes no damn sense whatsoever. You know, Oh yeah, Pilate's going to release a, a notorious Roman uh, rebel. Yeah, no. But on as allegory, it makes perfect sense. And speaking of Pilate, of course, um, ditto for all the trials, not just Jesus's, but Stephen's and Paul's and everything, virtually everything else in the book of Acts fails as, as history. Um, I talk about our sources for Jesus, not just in the Bible, but outside the Bible as well. Um, this particular picture, actually, I don't know if you can see the magic wand there in Jesus's hand, but he's using a magic wand to raise Lazarus from the dead. That's from a, a Roman catacomb. Um, and I talk about where did Christianity come from. That's one thing Nailed talked about all the ways that the official Christian story fails the reality check. Jesus' myth in action talks about where we think Christianity did come from. And book three, Jesus' myth in action, is um, subtitled The Gospel According to H.G. Wells, because after all this source and the heavy-duty um, biblical studies, we did just a fun take on um, what... 
Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson did with Cosmos with a spaceship, we're doing that with a time travel expedition to the, the origins and evolution of Christianity. Few final thoughts. This dialogue has been going on for a while. It calls for more humility on both sides, calmer discussion, and for us all to ratchet down the rhetoric and focus on the arguments, not on the personality clashes. And of course, I'm talking about Bart Ehrman and Richard Carrier uh, uh, in particular. Um, and also be careful because not all myth theories are created equal. Uh, Joseph Atwell's book, The Caesar's Messiah, is not just bullshit, but it's such incredible bullshit. It's like, if you had the brains to concoct this convoluted theory, you had to know that it was a non-starter right from the get-go. Like historicists, mythists could be wrong about much or all of this. If anything, Christianity's origins are even weakier and more gnarly than we may ever guess. And I have no doubt that there's so many more roots going off into paganism, uh, Greek, Egyptian, Persian, Zoroastrian, than we'll ever be able to track down. And if I'm wrong about it, I want to know. I'm happy to change my mind. And I already have on many things. Many of the cases that prop up, uh, the, the pillars that prop up this case, some of them I've changed my mind on. Uh, I've become officially agnostic on the idea of whether Nazareth was around during the first century or not. I've gone back and forth on that, and finally I'm just, I, I, you, there's just better arguments to be made, you know, because at worst, it just means that whoever wrote the Gospels never went to Nazareth, at best, I should say. Um, but here's not, what's not going to change my mind, and I hope it won't change yours either. That's an appeal to a consensus that's non-existent in the first place and not based in reality. Uh, in any case. And does any of this matter really? I mean, only if Jesus matters. And you know what? Maybe it doesn't matter all that much so much. If it turns out we're wrong, we don't need Jesus to be a myth. And if it turns out we're wrong in one day, good evidence for it does get uncovered, it's not as if Christianity is going to start making sense. We'll still be just fine atheists. But Christians can't say that. They can't even enjoy a relaxed agnosticism about you yeah, you know, the mere possibility of mythicism, not even for argument's sake. They need Jesus not to be a myth. But unfortunately, he is a myth. And that is true whether it's mythos camp or the historicist camp that ultimately comes out on top. No matter how that battle shapes up, at the end of the day, the Jesus of faith gets debunked either way. What is important about this argument, and what does make it worth our atheists arguing about, is that it shows what we can and can't know about who or what Jesus really was. And it, everything we learn from the back and forth of this argument on both sides help us, helps us call the bluff of anyone who says they know how Jesus wants you to behave or think or vote. If I do have an agenda, it is this. Not to turn you into a Jesus atheist like me, but instead, why point out all the reasons why you should be a Jesus agnostic at best. In fact, you should be a militant Jesus agnostic. So when someone asks you if there, you think there was a Jesus, you say, I don't know, and neither do you. Thanks very much. Do we have time for questions? We have loads of time for okay. questions. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to start. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I have a mic. Uh, going back to one of your points about the uh, Jesus being an apocalyptic, apocalyptic guy. Prophet. Okay, prophet. Apocalyptic. Yes. Uh, and of course, that's what Bart Ehrman is leaning yeah. to. And he would even agree with you that the Pontius Pilate story is is made up. But yeah. when you say it's not common for one, it's actually quite common that Romans would crucify anyone who was a troublemaker or being a troublemaker or problematic. I mean, that's why crucifixion in itself is not very a big deal because everybody in a way was kind of crucified at least so right. what's your yeah it's not I, mean, I don't find it weird that the romans would crucify anybody in judea at at the drop of a hat for any reason at all but what's weird is the way it's described in the gospels that first he has all these trials among jewish uh the sanhedrin and it's like okay you know first of all none of what he's saying here is blasphemy full stop None of what, none of the way the the trials pull out works historically. None of the, none of that should have been happening on the eve of Passover. You know, there's all these other things they should be doing. Um, he should have at least been put into prison and then tried on Monday. It's like the the problems with Jewish law in the in the Jesus trial they stack up so fast it's hard to keep 
up with them. And Jewish scholars, they just look at their heads and laugh. It's like, yeah, some Gentile wrote this. Clearly, <laughs> they don't know the first thing. Um, and uh, all in all, if Jesus had been found guilty, despite all those problems with it, they would have just taken him out and stoned him to death, as the law required. You know, the fact that they have it push it back onto the Romans shows that we're not talking about something historical. Um, we're talking about something allegorical. Um, as I look back at it and look into it, um, I'm finding more and more like the, the other apostles and even maybe Paul might have been mythicized. Um, I was wondering, where do we actually have the first point of a non-Christian acknowledging one of the early church fathers? Or... That's a great question. I don't know if you all heard it, but he said, what about the apostles and Paul? How, how mythological is he? It's funny you mentioned Paul because I'm just working on um, Robert Price's new book that I'm reading the advanced part. And Robert Price thinks that uh, mo most biblical scholars think that half the, the writings that we have from Paul are, uh, are forgeries, uh, that only the seven uh, are authentic. Robert Price doesn't even think that's right. He thinks they're all forgeries, and they're all coming from later in the second century. Um, and he actually makes some good arguments for that, that I, I can, I'm not sure if I'm 100% sold on that, but I can definitely see that what we think, when we think about Paul, and when we love Paul, and Christians love Paul, what they really love is what Luke is saying about Paul. So there's this divide. When you read the legitimate letters of Paul, if they are, in fact, the legitimate letters, and I tend to think they are because they're not very pretty, they're not very nice, the Paul that comes across in the legitimate letters, he's kind of a pissy bitch, and you just don't like him. And he doesn't seem very honest, he seems a little sleazy, and he seems to have some really interesting issues towards women that um, I go, I'm going to go into more in the book on sex and violence in the Bible when that comes out. Um, but the apostles, in fact, all the names of the characters in the Gospels seem to be coming from names that were taken out of Paul's letters. So that uh, when Paul talks about his enemies, the leaders of the Jerusalem church, James, Peter, and John, um, he says, I don't know who these guys think they are. I don't think they're real Christians. I didn't give it to them for a minute, you know. And it's like, oh, wait a second. You just said this is, you know, Jesus' brother. You said this is his friends and family. Um, well, it's interesting when you reread Paul's letters without the lens of evangelical. Paul never says anything like uh, disciples. He never uses the word disciples in any context whatsoever. He never says that these guys have any kind of connection to Jesus that he doesn't have. <laughs> When he says what it's an apostle, and when any writer, Christian writer before the Gospels are written, talks about what an apostle is, they're talking about somebody who's had a vision of Jesus and can prove it by, you know, uh, sharing the, the words of Jesus as came to them from, from beyond, you know. Um, that they found it in, in visions and in scripture, hunting scripture. Um, he never even tells us the story about Jesus appearing to him on the road to Damascus. Luke says that three times in three different versions that don't quite all add up. He never says anything remotely like that. Um, so the question of are these guys real or not is a fascinating one, and it's, it's, there's a lot to unpack in that. Because, yeah, there were Jerusalem church leaders named James, named Peter, named John. Were they, um, this, was Peter the same guy as Kephas? You know, their names are supposed to be the same, but they talk about it as if they're two different people. I guess what I wondered is when you just said those people were real, how do we know that? It, the only reason we know that is if Paul's letters are genuine, we know that there were Jerusalem church leaders who he opposed for most of his career that um, okay. that were real. Um, it's interesting, though, when you read the book of Acts and you hear about their stories uh, and compare anything that happens in Acts with anything that happens in Paul's letters, when they describe him, Luke is clearly making shit up because he makes it sound like they're all one big happy family and on the same team. And Luke is constantly going big tent and like bringing in the you know Pharisees like Gamaliel and having them say nice things. Bring in the John the Baptist cult, which was a rival of Christianity for at least a hundred years. Um, but he's making he's reaching out to all these people and co-opting them for his brand of Christianity. Um, I feel like I've gone down a rabbit hole, which is it happens every time we. Do things like this. Okay, so I have like 
pages of questions for Done, done, done. Because I've actually read all three books. Nice. Uh, oh, so I have, I have one stylistic. We should all be like him. I have one stylistic thing. Uh oh. If you're going to mention a Bible verse, you yeah. Ah, that, did I mention this is almost 900 pages? Yeah. <laughs> I also want to get into the, the stories of all the apostles, and it's like, yeah, that's not going to happen. That's going to be a later book, if, if ever, but go on. Yeah. Between the end and chapter notes. And that I, I do feel your pain. Okay. I do feel your pain. So I, I think most of my questions, but I'll, I'll try to have to do um, with uh, claiming Mark as purely allegory. Mm, gotcha. Um, gotcha. So. But I think my biggest question is, if Paul and Hebrews totally never talk about a corporeal Jesus, and I completely agree with you there, that's, that's just yeah. there. And not only that, but Paul talks a lot about Jesus coming, never, never talks about Jesus coming back. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if they all make no reference to an actual earthly human Jesus, yeah. why include them in the Bible at all with the four pieces of the New Testament, or yeah. if the people putting the New Testament together were kind of pro-celestial Jesus, why include the frickin' Gospels? Well, these are all awesome questions. I mean, can I pause for now? Yeah, yeah, more? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because here's the weird thing. Christianity had been around a hundred years, and the only writing we have is from one guy, Paul. Like, that's weird, full stop. It's like, where's everybody else who was writing during the whole first century, you know? Um, why is it that his books and his uh, letters have been edited and re-edited, and we don't hear from, uh, you know, Apollos of Alexandria? We don't hear about James or John. At, at least we don't have any real books from those people. We have fake books that were forged, you know, 100 years after the fact. But even those forgeries came decades and decades later. Um, why is that? That's weird. Um, why does um, and 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 if they were celestial, and I think they were. I mean, think. Mark clearly makes it celestial, and he, I think he clearly intends his audience, the smarter members of the audience, the more educated ones, to recognize that's exactly what he's doing. Matthew goes back and says, and this is in fulfillment of the scripture, Mark just lets it ride and lets them connect the dots. So that's, it's not just scripture, but also um, the Greek classics, you know, um, uh, blah, 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 like uh, the Bacchus, like the Iliad. Um, there's all these connections that way than have found too. Um, I'm surprised actually that we still have the Gospel of Mark at all because during the second century, the Gospel of Peter, which never even made the cut, was three times more popular at least than our Gospel of Mark. And if we didn't have the Gospel of Mark, we would have so much less idea that, uh, of what the, what is called the synoptic problem. That's the fact that um, Matthew and Luke have clearly taken their story from Mark. They expanded on it, they replaced it here, they corrected its mistakes, but obviously there's no way to deny, and for over a hundred years that's been the majority opinion, that they took Mark's story and beefed it up in their own ways. Not always compatible, but when they're not going off on their own, they're in lockstep with Mark. Um, so, and, and so the question, there's all these layers, constantly going back, at every layer we have of Christian writing, there's older layers that don't quite fit the new layer, but we still see them, and we still see the built on it. Yeah, I do, but, and one more quick caveat to that is, though, for the first 150 to 200 years, we have nothing in early Christianity. So who knows what has been left out? Who knows how close our writings are to the original writings? We have no way of knowing. In fact, even if the original writing had been magically stuck in a vault and just found now, we wouldn't be able to know that. We would just find, oh, here's an interesting variant of the Gospel of Mark. We have no way to identify what was the original oldest one. We've got a complete blackout period. I think um, I got to chapter 23. Like, all right, now we're going to get why Mark. But, I mean, are there any really concrete explanations of why Mark wrote Mark? The way or, he did. Or is, or, uh, or is what you presented there your guess? Yeah. Or, or is there something? Is there something a bit more to that? Yeah, and I, I'm following Randall Helms on this, who argues that Mark was written directly as a response to the war with Rome in the year 66 to 70, where he was trying to explain to early Christians why the Messiah didn't come and save Rome. And his the way he phrased it, it was um, it was a story trying to let them know that, yeah, the Messiah is going to come. He's going to come any minute now. 
but it's not time yet. And in the meantime, here's a survival manual, the, what we call the little apocalypse in, in Mark 13. Um, and, oh, and the women ran from the tomb, and that's why they didn't tell anybody. That's why you've never heard it until now, you know. Um, yeah. Uh-oh, another guy with his phone out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Oops, so, I'm going to admit, I don't buy the myths this thing. I said it. Um, and honestly, I, 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 I'm totally fine with that. It's like, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's not, it, it's, it's not a big deal to me. I've been studying for 15 years. It's not a big deal. Yeah, whether it was or wasn't. You know. yeah, I feel like you know, there's a lot of problems with gospel. Um, yeah. I feel like even if the historical views match it better with modern uh, religious sensibilities, um, boundaries, like, mm. you know, um, weird little cults here and there that yeah. nobody remembers. Because, um, you know, founders always disagree with how to interpret their, right. or I mean, the followers disagree with how to interpret right. their founders. I have a story about that. Remind me when you're done with your question. And, uh, so, and so I feel like with Jesus, what is the that explains that? So what is your... Wait, wait, when you say it explains that, you mean explains the difference it between... It explains the difference of problems with this author and that author. Mm. Different because you said, you know, biblical scholars have 50 different interpretations of right. Jesus. Like, well, you know, like we have a bunch of dinosaur novels and wild bill that right. that represent different interpretations. Of you should know, I wrote this book just for you because I don't just talk about yeah. that it's different. I talk about the ways that it's different and the, like, the literary, the, thing, the ways that we know, for instance, that it's not based on oral tradition, but that it's a literary construction and the literary thing. You know. So, what's your uh, preferred Evidence, I guess. <laughs> 900 pages. <laughs> um, and in a nutshell, in a nutshell, like a super, super nutshell, I think it started in the early first century with people like Paul, people like the guy who wrote Hebrews, as a Jewish version of the mystery faiths. And it, uh, I think Richard Carey has made the argument that if you went to somebody in the first century BC and said, What's a mystery faith? and they said, Blah, 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 they would tell you what it was. And well, what would a Jewish version of that look like? They didn't have Christianity. That's that's where I think it started in a nutshell. When you get the Gospel of Mark, once you get the Gospels in on the question, Christianity changes in a way that's complete. That's the that's the big watershed moment is pre Gospels and post Gospels, <coughs> and everything. All the other changes that have come since then, they still trace right back to guys saying, "Yeah, what if there, God was a one of us and lived on Earth?" And, you know. 666 Manger Street, and you know, then Joan Osborne. Uh, exactly, you know, and, uh, and and that changed everything because somebody said, "Oh, that's a great idea, but you got to, I got to fix this, I got to fix it." And somebody, wait, yeah, I like that. No, that's not right. Yeah, and, and you know, Jesus is not going to come right now. I mean, he's going to come a little soon, you know, any minute now, but you know, not right now, right now. Um, and and you, then you see John's gospel coming around, and uh, he doesn't even try to catch up with the other guys. He he just completely. Shuffle his things around to his the way he likes, and it's it's ironic. Luke, when he writes his gospel, he says, "Yeah, so many people are writing gospels these days. I thought it would be a good idea for me to, to uh, investigate the story and, and give you the real scoop, which is a lie because all he did was steal from Matthew and Mark." So, uh, appreciate you uh, being here tonight. I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm a Christian theologian. Uh oh. Uh oh. Used to pastor. Um. Dr. Sean Carroll, who's a pathologist, I mm. um, don't know if you know who Not he is. Um, I was talking to him about a year ago, and they're about ready to publish what is most likely a first century uh, scrap of the Gospel of Mark. And so um, that would be that would be interesting. Thing. And then uh, P52 uh, is is uh, the John Rylands papyri. That's from, right. From John, you said Mark. I'm sure that's just a slip of the tongue. It is. Um, knowing that John lived uh, to about 190 to 180, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what your sense of well, John is, but... I would um, say, what's your source for that, for starters? What's that, John Ryland's... No, no, that John lived to, to the year 100 or so. Uh, I would say church history. Uh, yeah. Tradition. Yeah. Um, 
I'm not here to be antagonistic. No, no I get it. I get it. And yeah. Things like that. I mean, and I appreciate you being here. And, and I, I probably have a lot of things to say. Yeah. Uh, but would, but um, you know when I had I had I had just recently learned of you, and so I was looking you up on YouTube. And I think uh, the, the comparison to the creationism, I'm not a creationist, I'm an older creationist. Gotcha. It's not 6,000. Thank you for that, first of all. So yeah. what I'm saying is I think, I think the, the, uh, the explaining away of the evidence is very close to what younger creationists do. There's, there's lots of evidence. And then from what I saw, you seem to explain away so many things. And, and so if, if you would address that, it seems like your methodology is, is uh, fundamentally skeptical, and so you explain away what others would see as, as you know, uh, evidence that would be sufficient to say, yes, Jesus actually lived. So right. I think that's what some people are, the yeah. creationism thing, because I get tired of young creationists constantly explaining, away. Sure. here's this, well, but this, this, this. Mark right. was allegory. You know, there's a lot of, I see a lot of similarities to uh, how you treat the, the gospel. There. Yeah. I mean, and to be I, honest, I, I, yeah. one, one last thing. I don't mm. know, I'm sorry to say this. No. I think a, a lot of problems with some of the some of the atheists and some of the skeptical uh, persuasion it is a matter of hermeneutics and knowing how to deal with the biblical text. I've seen so much uh, bad hermeneutical approaches from, from all you guys. Well, and, 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 and I haven't watched too much of you, so, but I'm just painting a broad picture. Yeah. So, um, gosh, it, so many things come to mind, but would you comment basically on, on, on your approach to, to be utterly skeptical? As uh, Aristotle said, you know, you give a document the benefit of the doubt, then if it shows that it's not. Yeah, Aristotle wasn't a good historian, though. <laughs> historians, historians don't give documents the benefit of the doubt. They said there's they say there's always a reason to distrust any historical claim made in any historical document, um, and it's, we only partial out our true our, our confidence in that document to see how well it corresponds to reality and evidentiary support from other uh, things. For example, the, the, we're constantly getting compared Jesus myth to like Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar, blah 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 blah, and they act as though these are. They, well, first of all, they act like so the evidence for Jesus is better than anybody else in human history. And it's like, yeah, that's not even true even if there was a Jesus. But the fact is, we don't have, we don't have no evidence for Jesus. But what evidence we do have for Jesus is not the best kind of evidence, but the very worst kind. And for so many of these pillars of evidence that we have, like physical evidence, textual evidence, the raw fact of history that, you know, if, unless Alexander the Great really had created an empire from India to, to Ireland, you know, we would, wouldn't know about it. With Jesus, all we need to know is that there were people in the first century and second century who believed in the preaching of Jesus. But everything else can be explained whether there is a Jesus or not. In fact, Kurt Knoll makes the argument that he doesn't think it's important anymore to ask if there was a Jesus or not because everything that we know about Jesus, everything that we have evidence for early Christianity can be explained from Paul on. Um, as far as the hermeneutics, as far as, as the, uh, the taking on a skeptical lens of it, um, I don't rule out miracles a priori. I don't say, well, miracles don't happen, so therefore this couldn't have happened. What I say is, if miracles happened, if this particular miracle could have happened, could it have happened and no one noticed it? Could uh, the Jerusalem cemetery uh, have all the graves open in one day, all the saints get out of their graves, appear to many in Jerusalem, uh, and as it says, and us having historical records that talk about, oh, and the, the temple wall is this big and this big, but not, not that, they don't mention this, you know? And um, I mean, that little Zombocalypse episode, that's just one thing in so many things of the Gospels. And that's, that's even if you take them all at face value, you can't because they don't agree with each other. John's Gospel doesn't even try to match up uh, the timeline or the, or the, um, the circumstances in the, uh, the other Gospels. If you ask John, why was Jesus arrested? Why was he sentenced to death? It's because he raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus, as a character, doesn't even appear in any of the other Gospels at all. They all have their own reasons for why he was arrested, why he got in trouble. 
Um, most of them is because of the temple cleansing. For John, that happened in the first week of his career. That's how he kicks off his career three years before. Um, so when I say there's, there's differences in our source materials, I'm not just talking about John said he wore a red shirt and Luke said it was a blue shirt. I'm talking about crucial fundamental issue, issues and all those things being equal, just on the sheer way these stories are constructed, we know their stories. Just from the way they're put together, we, we can recognize that there, this is an allusion to this Old Testament thing. This is an allusion to this classic Greek dramatic scene. Um, would you buy it, Michael Akona's dealing with it as far as uh, Greco Roman? Uh, uh, as far as, well, here's the thing. Because you know, the theologians well, have answered it since uh, Augustine dealing with what we call Bible discrepancy. We've dealt with that stuff. Well, you haven't done a very good job, to be honest with you. I mean, the the, the well, there's still a class of Christians today, so it has. But what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, that song and dance. It's like, how many times do you have to do this with your source material before you realize there's a problem with them? It's like, oh no, that's not a problem. No, that's not a problem. Not the, there's listen, and that's not a problem. No, 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 no. And it is a problem. It is a problem. When you've got one document that says Judas went and hung himself, and another document says he went into a field and burst asunder. And you've got a, a later Christian, and you got a, but you, and it's like, that's, that's just the one contradiction in those stories. Those stories, like, where did the money go? Why did they call it the field of blood? Who did it? You know, everything about that, the, the ones that they, they say, well, he got hung on a cliff, and so he fell, must have fallen down, you know, afterwards. It's like, there's no story that tells us that. You're making up your own gospel now. But more to the point, that's just the most easily one to harmonize. Um, and again, I don't want to put this on your shoulders, because... I mean, you're a Christian, and you know, and I'm not a Christian, and so I don't <coughs> tend to give it a benefit of the doubt when it seems very doubtful to me, and I don't apologize for that. Um, and at the end of the day, I think I use the same level of scrutiny that you use on the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness and the most, and every other religion out there. Which is hermeneutics as well. Exa exactly so. Yeah. Exactly so. Yeah. But and and I'll be honest with you, um, just on. A, strictly hermeneutical level, level. Um, I used to say the Kenosis hymn, there's still some interesting problems about it, but um, it, for me, was saying that Jesus didn't get the name Jesus until after his death. And it was a Christian who recently pointed out, well, no, no, it's talking about the Tetragrammaton, and, and, um, and I agree with him. It's like, you know what, you're probably right. Now, it also says that Jesus was made, not born, but that's a whole different issue. And, and the hymn itself, doesn't isn't talking about uh, crucifixion because that line has been added later. Um, so there's still some interesting characters, but it's, it's not just a question of hermeneutics. It's not just a question of I'm seeing it with my atheist lenses on. Um, so and I, at the end of the day, we're not going to agree. I mean, clearly, but I think we can have a beer. But we can have a beer and talk about it. I would like that very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I thank you for coming. And thank, thank you. Coming. Please give a hand. It's It is available on Amazon, and the audiobook we just finished recording in volume one, so that'll be coming out very soon, too. Just a quick, if you can't purchase the book today, if you go to Amazon Smile or Stanislaus Humanist, that helps.